Thank you so much for clicking on today's message from Elm Grove Baptist Church. Here at Elm Grove Baptist, our mission is the Great Commission, sharing the gospel and love of Jesus Christ with not only our surrounding community, but across this world. We're so thankful for the opportunity to present these messages online, and as we progress and move forward in our presentation, we ask that you continue to like and subscribe to these videos, and don't forget to share them with your friends and loved ones. Now, please enjoy today's message from Elm Grove Baptist Church. If you've knelt beside the rubble of an aching broken heart when the things you gave your life to fell apart you're not the first to be acquainted with sorrow grief or pain but the Have your Bible with me tonight. Go to Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4. It's raining outside, but it's dry in here. And I'm just happy to be in church. Mark 4. I'm not going to take any credit for this outline. Here's a preacher trick for you. Every now and then we hear a message that we like, so we take parts of it. 
So, uh, don't think this is all me. Because <laughs> uh, it isn't. Mark 4, but for some reason, uh, God placed this message on my heart. I heard it first a few years back. And um, it's just been uh, on the forefront of my mind, I'd say for a few weeks. And I felt like God was just waiting for tonight for uh, me to preach this message. And I don't know why, because it seems like I've been preaching on a lot of storms lately. But anyway, tonight we'll look at a storm, and we're actually going to continue on. We're going to read a pretty lengthy portion of Scripture, so bear with me. Mark 4, start in verse 35. Mark 4, verse number 35. It says this, In the same day, when the even was come, he saith unto them, Let us pass over unto the other side. And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship, and there were also with them other little ships. And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship, so that it was now full. And when he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow, they were awake, and said unto him, Master, carest not that we perish? And he rose and rebuked the wind, and said unto the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are ye so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said one to another, What manner of man is this that even the wind and sea obey? And they came over unto the other side of the sea, into the country of the Gadarenes. Verse number 2 of chapter 5. And when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit, who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no man could bind him, no, not with chains, because he had been often bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces, neither could any man tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. But when, they saw, when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him, and cried with a loud voice, and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of the Most High God? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. For he said unto him, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. And he asked him, What is thy name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he besought him much that he would not send them away out of the country. Now there were there nigh to the mountains a great herd of swine feeding. And all the devils besought him, saying, Send us into the swine, that we may enter into them. Verse 13. And forthwith Jesus gave them leave, and the unclean spirits went out and entered into the swine, and the herd ran violently down a steep place into the sea. They were about 2,000 and were choked in the sea. And they that fed in the swine uh, fled and told it in the city and in the country, and they went out into the sea what it was that was done. And they come to Jesus and see him that was possessed with the devil. And he had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. And they that saw it told him how it befell him that was possessed with the devil and also concerning the swine. And they began to pray him to depart out of the coasts. And when he was coming to the ship... He that had been possessed with the devil prayed that he might be with him. Howbeit Jesus suffered him not, but saith unto him, Go home to thy friends, and tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee, and hath had compassion on thee. And he departed and began to publish in Decapolis how great things Jesus had done for him, and all men did marvel. Let's pray and get into this this evening. Lord, I'm so grateful just to be in your house tonight. Lord, just how encouraging it is is just anytime you walk into church Lord there's always somebody who's smiling always a hand to shake Lord I'm so thankful for our church family and friends Lord I pray tonight you just forgive me of my failures Lord I lack so much in my life and I just pray that tonight whatever I say will be only from you it'll be only what we need to hear Lord I pray you pour out your spirit on this place and you speak to hearts now we ask this in Jesus name amen Typically, looking at the end of Mark 4 and the beginning part of Mark chapter 5, we would typically say there are two sermons here. Most of the time, somebody is going to look at the storm and how Christ rebuked it. And most of the time, someone's going to point out the fact that the maniac of Gadara, 
right? And the swine and the legion and the casting into the swine and so forth. And oftentimes we look at these two great miracles separately, but there's one very key verse that we're going to look at in a little bit that ties these two together. It's interesting though, starting in the end of chapter number four, we can see the desire of Christ. We can see his desire looking at verse 35 and 36. It says, And the same day when the even was come, he saith unto them, Let us pass over unto the other side. And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship. And there were also with them other little ships. You know, the desire of Christ here was for him, leaving multitudes of people that he had been ministering to, uh, helping with diseases, helping with so forth, leading people to Christ. He said, you know what? It's time for us to go on the other side. He, he had desired now that they gathered their disciples, they get in the ship, and now they're going to head uh, uh, over the Sea of Galilee. You know, it's interesting as we continue down and it says that there was this great storm and in verse 38, it says that he went back and he fell asleep. You know, the desire of Christ obviously was to seek and save. We can see that in scripture. That was the purpose of his coming here. But now we can see this desire of Christ is just to take from this coast and go to this other coast for a specific reason. And as we look at Christ and, and he goes back into the ship and he puts his head on this pillow, right? We could see as we could say as the boat was leaving the dock, he was back there fluffing his pillow, right? As, as they began to row out away from the shore, he was back there maybe getting a blanket ready, right? As they began to set sail, here he was sawing logs. I mean, Christ was very comfortable in this situation. His desire was made known, and now let us go to the other side. Let's just go. I'd like to point out right there the fact that uh, he said, let's go to the other side, meaning, hey, we're going to the other side. He didn't talk about anything in between, just we're going to go to the other side. You know, Christ resting, it's uh, sometimes easy for us to think of Christ in a more human manner. Especially in a situation like this. He's asleep. God doesn't sleep. Right? And we think of how Christ was 100% God, but yes, he was still 100% man. I mean, so much so that Christ made the water that they were sailing on, but he still needed water, being 100% man, to hydrate his body. Christ was 100% God in so much that he made food that I'm sure they had provisions that they had, but he was still 100% man in the fact that he needed nourishment. He needed to eat bread. He was 100% God that he made us a day of rest in the beginning in creation, but he was still 100% man so much that he exhausted himself and he needed to rest. It's easy for us to look at these, uh, these things and these pictures of Christ and say, he's just a man, but he wasn't. And I want to make that point clear. He is still 100% God. We could see his desire. We could see the descent of the storm in verses 36 and 37. And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was into the ship. And there were also with them other little ships. And there arose a great storm of wind. And the waves beat into the ship so that it was now full you know, looking at the Sea of Galilee where they were uh, sailing across, it said that I've never personally stood there. But if you stand on the shore, it's almost like looking at an ocean. It's so vast. It's a big body of water. And they refer to it as the Sea of Galilee because of its size. And looking at it, I was looking at pictures of it this afternoon, actually, just to make sure I'm not saying anything wrong. And, and there's mountains and hills all around it. In so much that maybe the cooler air that was gathering on top of these hills and mountains, it would begin to be pushed down onto the warmer, lower climate of the sea, and it would cause these storms to come up. And this storm came in, and it was beginning to, to build up and beginning to uh, 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 get to a point where it was getting pretty scary for these guys. And it's interesting because uh, across in the Gadarene area, I was researching gods of the weather, uh, and they used to worship these gods. The uh, Romans t uh, eventually came into that area and, and kind of tried to conquer them and tame them and do their thing there, and they referred to the god of weather as Jupiter. 
And uh, there was a lot of demon activity in that area as well. I mean, we got to that in chapter 5. So not only was there the weather situations where the warm and the cool weather are meeting and we're getting a little bit of that today, I think. And, and now all of a sudden on top of that, there's a, a demonic powers that are obviously able to maybe tamper a little bit with the weather. We can read of uh, uh, the powers of the air in Ephesians. And all of these things are happening to create this specific storm that these men were going through. The descent of the storm. We could see the desperation of the disciples. Verses 37 and 38. And arose a great storm of the wind, and the waves beat into the ship so that it was full. And he, talking about Christ, was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they awake him and say to him, Master, care us not that we perish? I mean, these guys were worried, sick. Hey, don't you care? We're about to go down. The ship is filling up. Don't you care? You're, you're asleep. What's the matter with you? Don't you care about me? They're facing this storm and they're asking these questions. Why in the world are you sleeping right now and allowing this to come up in my life? They were worried. It's interesting because we can come from our perspective not being in the boat. We can come from our perspective of not knowing their situation and say, those guys, why didn't they have faith? Just like Christ asked, right? Well, of course, of course God's going to see him through. Like I said a minute ago, hey, let us go to the other side. They're going to make it. But being in that moment, I mean, these guys, think about it. They were fishermen. They were familiar with this body of water. They had been out on there. They were men of the sea. They had been on ships. They understood storms and weather and things like this that would come up in these situations. They weren't just anybody to say, oh, you know, that storm is not a big deal. This was a big deal. This was coming in and, and, and taking them by surprise, and, and they were not ready for this. Don't you care, God? Have you ever wondered if God truly cared about you? You know, you're going through a situation and you say, God, do, do you really even care about me? Do you know what I'm going through? Do you understand the situations that I'm facing? And that's when the deity of Christ comes in. In the last part of chapter 4 here, starting 39, it says, And he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are ye so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? You know, God standing up and being able to do that, it is not only uh, 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 solidifying his 100% God, but it's showing that he does care. He is concerned. When we cry out, he's there and willing and able to answer. I mean, just a couple weeks ago, I, I, I spoke from Nahum and how he is in control in the whirlwind. He has his way. He knows the situations that you're facing. He knows what you're going through. <laughs> you know, it's, it's interesting because as we continue in verse 40 and 41, it says, And he said unto him, Why are ye so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? And they feared exceedingly. And they feared exceedingly and said one to another, What manner of man is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Have you ever caught that in that passage? How it doesn't say that they were afraid when the storm was happening. We could tell that they were worried. They were concerned. The ship was filling up. The water was blowing in. But it never said, and the men were so afraid that they went and woke up Christ. No, it just said that they awake him. But now all of a sudden, after Christ said, peace be still, after he asked them, why are you so afraid? Where is your faith at? Then they feared exceedingly. You know, this is showing something uh, that we could say is the unexpected fear. Right? They were familiar with storms. They were familiar with life on a boat. But now something unexpected, and that unexpected was the deity of Christ. 
When they awoke him, we could assume that they were like, hey, come on, buddy. We need your back. We need your biceps. We need your triceps. We need everything you got. We got to row through this thing. But instead, they got the deity of God to stand up and say, that's enough. Knock it off. <laughs> Peace, be still. And it was so. <laughs> Have you ever been unexpectedly scared? There's a nasty little habit that three little children around the church have developed of trying to frighten me at random points during the week. I love the Miller kids, and they enjoy trying to scare me. Have you ever been in a dark church? It's scary. <laughs> I don't care how old you are. Don't even say, I'm not scared. It's scary. Okay. It's, it's, it's creepy walking through a dark church. And now imagine walking through a dark church and just expecting a little one to jump out. Boogie, boogie. Okay. It, it happens to me, I would say, at least five times a week. <laughs> they have yet to actually scare me, though. Okay? And they get so mad at me. How do you not? There was one time over in the other building. This building's creepy. The other building is terrifying. Okay. <laughs> So I was in the other building. I'm turning off all the lights. It was after a Wednesday night with the teens. I turn off the, the main room lights there. And as the door shutting, because I was up on the platform, and as the door was shutting, I see two little legs and a body shoo, run and cut the corner. And the door shut. And I said, mm-hmm. I know what's going to happen. So I decided, in my loving manner, to open the door act like it's everything's normal then I take off down the hall jump and I go bah! and all of a sudden Gavin Miller goes Whoa! and he jumps straight up legs come out I don't even, even know how slid down the wall on his butt and he's sitting there <laughs> that's what these guys were experiencing Man, this is, are you kidding me? We're expecting somebody to get up and help me row the ship. But instead he gets up and he says, peace. And the wind and the waves and everything just stop. I imagine the scene of, of Christ coming out and it's all gray and thundery and cloudy. And he says, peace. And then it just parts and it's all sun coming through and the birds. Right? And it's peaceful. The help was unexpected. They weren't ready for that. But then we can see as we continue on in chapter number five, we're introduced to another character. And we see the despair of the demoniac. Chapter five, verse number one, and they came over unto the other side of the sea. Just like Christ said, let us pass over. And they came over to the other side of the sea into the country of the Gadarenes. And when he was come out of the ship, this is the verse that ties both of these stories together. And I want you to really see this. And when he was come out of the ship, immediately, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. Right away. What is this showing? It's showing us that this man was expecting this ship to land there. This man, I mean, as we continue reading, we can, we can see that he spent most of his time up in the mountains, up in the tombs. He didn't live on the beach. He didn't live in this little tiki hut with his, his little hammock and his little coconut straws. And he didn't do these things. He was up in the mountains, hooting and hollering and cutting himself and doing all of these crazy things. But immediately, once Christ got out of his ship, he was met with a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling amongst the tombs. No man can bind him, no, not with chains, because he had been often bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces, neither could any man tame him. They tried. You know, it, it, it's interesting, and, I, and I've heard this said, the world loves a sinner up to a point. Right. The world loves a sinner up to a point. 
Okay, we, we, can, we can put on this front that says, oh, they are accepting. They love me just how I am. They're going to let me be me and do me, and I'm going to live my life just the way I want to, and they're going to be accepting to a point. There, there, there comes a point when those so-called friends and those so-called uh, uh, um, uh, fellow people, are, and, and they're going to say, yeah, I, we don't want you coming around. Maybe when uh, you begin to act funny and you begin to act weird and, and now uh, the, the bars aren't as full as they used to be because you're around. That's what's happening here. Maybe the grocery stores, people are, are going to the other store across town because uh, this guy might be there. To a point, the world's going to love a sinner. But once it begins to take away from how they want to live, they don't want a Christian walking around showing them and convicting them with a certain type of lifestyle. So they're going to accept you just how you are until you begin to act a certain way, talk a certain way, dress a certain way. And these guys, they tried. They tried with this maniac. They tried to do everything that they could. They tried to tame him, it says at the end of verse number four. No man could tame him. They sent him to the modern day psychologists and the, the psyche people and, and they tried to get him on anything that would help this man. But one day this guy decided he was going to open that door just a little bit. Give the devil an inch. He'll take a mile, we've heard. And that's what happened. He, he let him in just a little bit. Maybe one demon. He said, ah. I can handle this. It's fine. I'm living like the world. And then another one, uh, it's okay. I'm living like the... But then all of a sudden, the door was propped open. And now we can assume thousands of demons over time, progressively, just came in and, and possessed this man and got him to the point where the world said, we're done with you. You've done everything that we liked. And now you're, you're a little bit too weird for us. He was in despair. Always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. You know it's bad when you're living with the dead people, because they're the only ones who can tolerate you. Always, day and night, in the mountains. But immediately... You know, I, I look at this story and I, and I can imagine he's up in these mountains and day after day he sees how the, the weather swells down and, and it begins to twirl and cause these storms. And, and day after day he feels the demon possession and those, those uh, powers of the air rising up maybe from him, maybe from around him. And day after day these things are beginning and he's looking out on the, the water on the Sea of Galilee and these ships are getting tossed to and fro and he's hearing people cry out, help, help, and all day night and day he sees these storms and everything is happening until one day he's up there just like normal and he sees another ship with some other small ships coming and he says okay and he feels those powers rising up he says okay ship be careful and he sees the winds coming down okay ship be careful and now all of a sudden a man comes out of nowhere and it seems like he came from the back and he says peace and everything stops and he says, wait a minute. And those demons begin to talk maybe inside of him. And they say, I know who this is. There's only one person who could do this. And that man began to fight his way and, and go against these demons maybe to the point where he got down to the beach. And immediately there met him, Christ. Immediately he was there. And when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him. Verse 7 says, And cried with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of the Most High God? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. For he said unto him, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. And he asked him, What is thy name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he besought him much that he would not send them away out of the country, now there was there nigh unto the mountains a great herd of swine feeding, and all the devils besought him, saying, Send us into the swine that we may enter into them. And forthwith Jesus gave them leave, and the unclean spirits went out and entered into the swine. And the herd ran violently down the steep place into the sea. There were about 2,000 and were choked in the sea. 
And they that fed the swine fled and told it in the city and in the country. And they went out to the sea what is what, what is was that was done. And they came to Jesus and see him that was possessed with the devils. We know that guy. He had the legion. And he was sitting there and he was clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. It was unexpected. And when they saw it, they told him how it befell to him that was possessed with the devil and also concerning the swine. And they began to pray him to depart out of their coast. And when it was come into the ship, he that had been possessed with the devil prayed him that he might be with him. Howbeit Jesus suffered him not, but saith unto him, Go home to thy friends and tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee and hath had compassion on thee. So, Brother Daniel, what are you getting at? We saw the desire of Christ to come across. The descent, the storm coming in, the desperation of his disciples. We saw the deity of Christ present itself with peace be still. We saw the despair. But look at this deliverance. Look at that deliverance. We just read about it. A man, and I I want you to think about this. Because I can guarantee, and, and, and that's the only reason I feel I was supposed to preach this, because there are people, and we've talked about this in this room, that are going through something. And we, we constantly deal with it. Pastor Steve and I, we hear constantly, Miss Christie, we hear constantly about people. We say, man, we, we hurt for you. We break for you. We love you. We just want to see the best that God has for you. And we hear it constantly and constantly. And here's a man who was constantly trying. He was constantly breaking. That storm that you're going through, though. Let me put it this way. You can be in a storm and be perfectly in the will of God. I think there's confusion there sometimes. That's why I wanted to point it out. You can be in a storm in your life and be perfectly in the will of God. Because he, he has his way in the whirlwind. We, we, we understand. I, I know, Brother Daniel. I've heard that preach. You preached it. We, we know that. His disciples, as scared as they were, as worried as they were, as fearful as they were, As scared as you are, (laughs) as worried as you are, you say, this storm is dumb, Brother Daniel. I've tried to live for God. I've been trying to live right. I've been trying to do things by the book. Why in the world is God putting me through this? You know, the storm that those disciples faced, I don't think it was for them. I don't think it was for them. Did it help with their faith? I'm sure it did. Did it help with their understanding of who Christ was? I'm sure it did. But think of the deliverance that came from that. Think of the fact that this man, this man so overcome by possession, so overcome by by fear, and so overcome by just being broken, and he sees them coming across just like every other ship. But peace be still. A man got saved because God trusted Someone else enough to go through that storm. Maybe God is trusting you enough with a storm for someone else's sake. I can imagine this man one day, maybe a, a, a 30, 40 years from this moment, and he, he's walking streets of gold, and, and maybe he comes across, and he's cutting through the crowd, and he says, excuse me, pardon me, don't mind me, Peter, hey, John, hey, hey, Lee, hey, 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 guys, guys, it's me. And they said, uh, hey, brother, because it's okay to do that in heaven, because we're all brothers. And he says, I, I, I didn't expect you to remember me. You know, I, I was covered in bruises last time you saw me. Yeah, you, you know, I, I had cuts and scars all over me. I, I, I probably look, you know what, I don't like to admit this. I, I was naked, okay? Last time you saw me, he's like, I was that demonic man. Because of that storm you went through, I was up on my mountain. I said, whoa, look at that man down there. 
That's God. That's Christ. And even though you were going through that storm, it was for me. Everything you went through, that was for me. You might have been fearful. You might have been, you might have been afraid. You might have been worried. But man, you came through it. And because of that deliverance, I got saved. And not only him. Christ said in verse 19, go home to thy friends. Tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee and hath had compassion on thee. And he went home and watched the football game. And he went home and never came on Wednesdays or Sunday nights or Sunday school. And he went home. He didn't tell any loved ones or friends about Christ, even though he had been delivered. No. What happens? He departed and began to publish in Decapolis. Decapolis was a group of about 10 or more cities. Right? He didn't just stay local. He didn't just stay in Bonner. Now he's in Baser. Now he's in Lidwood. Now he's in Leavenworth. Now he's going all over the place. How great things Christ had done for him. And all men did marvel. I like that nickname, Billy Bad. He ain't Tomcat. Okay, we got to talk to this gentleman the other day, me and preacher in the office, and he was telling us stories and how he's got still a mean left. And it's exciting to see how far people come. There's a deliverance, and we, we have these names, and, and it's just a marvelous thing to see. Man, God did that in your life. And you're struggling, and, and you're suffering. And you're hurting and you're afraid and and it's okay to be those things. The disciples were. He didn't get up and say, knock it off, guys. You're embarrassing me. No. He said, hey, it's okay. Just have a little faith. And he calms it for them. And because of that moment, because of what they went through, because of what they endured, someone from the outside looking down, looking in could say, man, Man, because of that, look at where I am. Look at what's come of me. God may be just willingly trusting you enough. Isn't that interesting? He's trusting you with a storm. He's not putting you through one. He's trusting you in one. He's saying, listen, I know it's scary. I got it. Okay, God. Hey, I know you're worried, but I got this. All right, God. Hey, it's a difficult situation. It's a difficult season. Seasons change. They come and go. There's a time for it. Say, okay, God. I was listening to the pastor that presented this, and he was telling the story of a young couple right out of high school, 19 and 20 years old. Madly in love, been dating for a few years. The young man walked up to the pastor and said, I'm going to ask her to marry me. He said, awesome. Young man did everything right, godly young couple. The, he went to the father, asked for permission to marry the daughter. He said, please, okay, and everything was fine. And he came up to the front of the church. He said, I remember marrying them. He says, nine, day late, nine days later, he borrowed a motorcycle from a friend. And his friend said, be careful, this has got a lot of juice. This is a tough motorcycle. Are you sure you can? I can handle it, it's fine. 20-year-old kid. I can handle it, it's fine, and he couldn't. And he took a turn too sharp, and he flung off the side and hit his head, and, and he died. Nine days after marrying his young bride, she was a widow, He said, I remember 12 days after marrying that young couple at the altar, he said, there is cast it, just lay open. And he said, what do you say in that situation? I have no clue. I don't know if any pastor in here could have an idea of what to say to a young widow of nine days. And he said he, he began and the service and he got about halfway through and that young lady just raised her hand up. And he said, yes. She said, can I say a few things? Packed house. Unsaved friends, family. 
And she got up front and she said, I don't know why God is putting me through this, but I'm so thankful for those nine days. And she went and sat down. I don't know why God is putting you through whatever he is. I, I don't, I, and I can't tell you why. I can't look the scripture and be like, this is exactly why you're going through that difficulty in your life. I can't do it. But I can imagine a line of people one day in heaven approaching that young lady and her spouse and saying, if you hadn't gone through that storm, I wouldn't be here. Think of Brother uh, uh, Foster down in Midland talking about how his daughter engaged. They hadn't even made it to the altar yet. Her and her fiancé are out on that four-wheeler and the group that they were with cut out ahead and they were coming along and then going 35, 40 miles an hour and a tree just falls out of nowhere. Kills both of them instantly. I can't tell you why those things happen. But I can tell you because of that girl's testimony and because of a father who was willing to continue in the ministry, I would guarantee you hundreds, if not more, are saved. Amen. Whatever you're going through, maybe it's not for you. Don't kick yourself. Quit blaming everything on yourself. Maybe thank God for situations that are coming up in your life and say, I don't know why you're doing this, but Lord, whatever it is, it's yours. And see what comes out on the other side. Just imagine the number of people that we impact because we go through something traumatic in our lives the proper way. Trusting in the one who created the storm in the first place. Let's bow our heads, close our eyes, Ronnie. You can start to sing. I don't know every situation in here. But I can guarantee you, in each section of this auditorium, there's people hurting. There's people questioning. Maybe you've had those moments to say, why God? Why are you putting me through this? Why, why is this happening to me? I've been faithful. I trust you. I'm trying to do what's right. He's just waiting for you to see that it's not for you. It's not for you. It's for that person that you can reach in such a mighty way. And one day, maybe you'll see them in heaven. The altar's open tonight. If you're dealing with anything, come lay it down. God wants to give you that peace. Altar's open.